All right. So my first question actually is who are you? So how many people here write code? All right. How many people here design, do art? And how many people here write checks? <laughs> like, <laughs> All right, so, so that's about a third, a third, a third. I do see a few bar camp shirts in the audience, so um, there will be some geeky content here, but I will try not to go too hard into the engineering unless people ask me questions, and then I have no promises. Um, but I was really excited to give a talk about creativity. Like Normally, I give talks about machine learning algorithms, which are uh, very much, um, machine learning is a very creative discipline, but you have to get through a lot of rigorous <laughs> analysis to get to the creative part. But thinking about creativity uh, is a really fun exercise. And where creativity comes from and how we, we create things within pretty rigid frameworks. So that's what I'm hoping to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit in abstract uh, and then go into some very specific examples of work that, um, that I've done at Bitly um, because it, it provides a good frame for this. And then zoom back out again sort of into the abstract. Um, and you might think it's an odd thing to ask a scientist to come and talk about creativity. Uh, I don't think it's an odd thing at all. Uh, I spend a lot of time fighting this misperception that science is not creative. It is, in fact, the most creative thing we can do. And there is no greater insult to a scientist to tell them that they have a brilliant solution to an inconsequential problem. And there's a lot of creativity in identifying what those problems are. And so. Um, for those in the room who only know that I like cookies and cheeseburgers, I'll just give you a little bit of my background. Um, I'm a computer scientist. I also studied English in my undergrad program. Um, I've always loved both creative writing and technical writing. I like writing code. Uh, I've been doing it since I was a tiny little kid. If you have kids, teach them to code, um, <laughs> please. Uh, and I currently do a bunch of different things. Um, so I'm the chief scientist at Bitly. Uh, at least 10 different people in the last two days have asked me what that actually means. Um, and aside from having a good job title, that means that uh, I work with a team of scientists, engineers, data scientists to take a huge data asset, I'll get into that more a bit later, and to learn things from it that are interesting about humanity and to build products on it. Uh, so it's a mix of pursuing things that are cool because they're cool and pursuing things that will earn us money because we like money. Um, I also co-founded a nonprofit called Hack NY. Um, Hack NY is designed to help talented engineering students find their way into the creative technologist community in New York. Uh, our tagline is, we want to save kids from the street, but we mean Wall Street. <laughs> in, in New York City in particular, uh, when you're studying math, engineering, and science, the most prestigious path when you graduate is finance. It pays a lot of money. Uh, the second most prestigious is consulting. And the third is that you might go to graduate school and become an academic expert on your discipline. Uh, until recently, startups and more entrepreneurial efforts had no place in that idea of what a career could look like once you finished a degree. And so we created Hack NY as essentially a hack to the entire system that would take the most talented and creative of those engineering students and provide them with a prestigious pathway into our startup and entrepreneurial ecosystem. And we do that by having two programs. Um, one program is open to any student anywhere in the world who wants to come to New York during the school year and participate in events. We have a series of hackathons. Um, in the fall, they're designed to get students to show off their technical skills in a non-academic setting. I don't know how many of you have spent time as a teacher, but I can tell you that grades are bullshit. And you, you can't. <laughs> See, if I knew when I was a student what I knew as a professor, it would have gone a lot better for me. But, um, but uh, you can't learn about somebody's creativity or engineering potential from their computer science course grades. So we try and get them hacking and building things together. Uh, we also bring the startups from New York in so they get to meet people like the engineers behind Foursquare, Tengen, or Bitly, um, or a number of other cool companies. And that, that makes them aware of the program. And then there's a fellowship that is highly competitive. It accepts under 10% of applicants. Again, open to any student in the world who wants to come to New York for a summer. If they win this fellowship, they get to live for free in New York City. They get a program and a curriculum of events through the summer and they get a job at a startup, but we don't tell them which one. So the beauty of this is that they apply in the fall when they're applying for all their consulting jobs. 
And then in the spring, <laughs> Hack and Y says, okay, this is the startup we want to match to you. And there's actually a machine learning algorithm I wrote called HackMatch that does the filtering. It's on my GitHub page. Um, to be fair, we, we only use that to screen things. Okay, I'll speak up. Uh, we don't actually like assign people's fate based on the math. It's just a way to get the top 10 matches out of a set, and then we, we actually have someone who manually makes sure it works out. Um, and so Hack and Y is going into its third summer this year, and I am pretty proud to say it's been immensely successful in that goal of um, federating and mentoring the next generation of New York tech entrepreneurs and creating a tight social circle among them. So I also do a bunch of other things, but that's all of my background I'm going to talk about. Um, you know, I like to cause trouble, and when I meet new people, I like to ask them this question. So, you know, okay, I know you're working on another social mobile application. What is your craziest idea? Okay, so if you had to answer this, um, I, I've asked a lot of people this question, and this is usually the response I get, is a look like that, like, um, yeah, you must be kidding. Uh, it's really hard to get people to tell you the ideas that they're not sure are good ideas, but those are the ones you want to hear. Uh, and so we've done a few things in New York to try and make that happen. Um, but what we usually find is that there are a lot of people with good ideas. All right, it was Star Wars Day, so it sort of got into my head. Each of them alone is really boring. Um, you know, Ewoks are fine by themselves, uh, Jedi, the Dark Knights. But a story happens when they come together. And so the theme of creativity uh, that I really want to talk about is not creativity within one's own discipline, but creativity at the intersection of disciplines. Um, and that we found that when you combine people's crazy ideas together, something really crazy comes out, and that can lead to either spectacular success or spectacular failure, either of which is great. All right. So once again, um, I am a scientist. I'm going to talk a little bit about Bitly uh, to give some framework for thinking through these kinds of ideas, and then we'll take it away from there. Is that good? Yeah. yeah. All right. So how many people here have heard of Bitly? And not just this morning. <laughs> like, okay, so, okay, so most people who know Bitly know we take big things and make them small. And we did just see a cake with this logo on it, which was amazing. Um, I tweeted a photo. Uh, that means, for most of our history, all we've done is taken things like this, that's a URL, and made it look like that. And we provide that short link, bit.ly slash some hash. Um, for the nerds in the room, it actually used to be a hash, a Jenkins hash, in fact, until we uh, had way too many collisions and had to switch it to not a hash anymore. Now we pre-generate all available <laughs> series of characters and hand them out, but they are not uh, sequential so please don't try to crawl them. Um, <laughs> so we give people these short links and they can share them. And it's actually not, so when Bitly started a little over three years ago, short was important. So Twitter had this 140 character limit. They didn't, they counted URLs against that limit. Um, short was actually an important feature. Nobody cares about short anymore. Now they just care about having a shareable social object on the internet. And the URL is the atomic element of shareable objects on the internet. So when you click a Bitly link, you get a 301 redirect, that is an HTTP standard that takes you from the short URL to the long URL. Uh, I'm a huge fan of HTTP status cats. <laughs> and these Bitly links show up in all kinds of places. So this is one I found that was being clicked from Orlando. You can see why. Um, here's another one. That's the Dalai Lama. He's a huge fan of Bitly. Uh, here's another one. Yeah, yeah, just, you know. Um, so people use Bitly on YouTube all the time. What's even more interesting to me is that they use Bitly within Minecraft uh, and within other virtual worlds like Second Life and Habbo Hotel. Um, people use Bitly links when they give talks, which I always take pictures of, but they never come out really well. Um, because you can, you can actually define the keyword at the end, so you can have Bitly slash Urban Rethink, and it can go wherever you want. Um, so an email, of course, is still the biggest social network, no matter what Facebook tells you. Um, and so we see a lot of clicks on a lot of links. And Bitly is no longer a link shortening service. It is an analytics service. Um, and it has always been about the data on the click-through. So 
A trick for anyone in the audience, if you add a plus sign to the end of any Bitly link, you will get a page that looks like this, and it will show you how many people have clicked on that link, the social networks referring them, the countries they came from, and then we pull things out of Twitter's search API to show you who's tweeted it and all that fun stuff. And for the nerds in the audience, all of that data is available through the API, which is better. Um, and so we've also learned over time what organic human sharing looks like. And I'm sad to say that this is a canonical example of organic human social sharing at high volume. You can read the headline there. I'm not going to read it out loud. Um, OK, for the back of the room, it involves a Kardashian and bikinis and pregnancy. Um, but we always see this pattern of a spike and then a decay. Uh, and we can tell the different networks by the characteristics of that spike and decay. Um, and this content, we can also watch it just jump from network to network, uh, which happens quite often. Uh, and I think that's what makes Bitly data so interesting, is that it's this independent source sitting among all the different <laughs> mechanisms that human beings use to share things with each other. And it's totally international. Um, this is actually a, there's no map here, this is a sphere with a dot, oh, sorry, um, by latitude and longitude. Uh, actually, from a year ago, from an hour of bit.ly clicks, um, we see the US is the biggest company, or company, country, followed by Great Britain, Canada, Japan, Brazil, uh, and then we go into the European countries. But it's a global phenomenon. Like, we've even seen uh, usage in you know, rural parts of Africa for mobile devices. Uh, and so I'm happy to admit to you that this was a surprise. This, by the way, was the cutest baby in 2011. Um, he got the most, the most clicks for an image file called something with the word baby in it. Um, that took many hours on our Hadoop cluster. Uh, it was well worth it. But, uh, but um, and when I talk to entrepreneurs, I always try to emphasize that Bitly was an accident. Uh, nobody woke up uh, with the brilliant vision for a URL shortening company. Um, Bitly was actually a feature in another product. That product was called Firefly, and it was developed by a company called Betaworks in New York. And the idea behind Firefly was that uh, it was JavaScript that publishers could embed on their site, and it would allow you to see in real time the cursors of everyone else on the site with you. And the idea was that it would engender this new age of intellectual discourse around shared content browsing. What actually happened was that people told each other to you know, F off and said things like, stop humping my cursor. And it, it did exactly the opposite of what it was supposed to do. Um, so that product, even though you know, at the time, I believe it had somewhere around 20,000 concurrent users, it was not at small scale. Um, they shut it down wisely. But two companies came out of that piece of technology, uh, Bitly, which was the URL sharing mechanism, and another company called Chartbeat, uh, which does real-time web analytics, but for publishers. So it turns out that you don't want to see who else is on a website you're on, but the person who owns that website very much wants to see this real-time heat map of activity and what people are doing. Uh, and so we have a sister company called Chartbeat that's actually upstairs in the same building from us now uh, that does that. And it's built on that same piece <laughs> of technology we use, in fact, the same in-memory database still. And it's still called Memoryfly because of Firefly, uh, though, yeah, we're, we're trying to change the name to something else. We, we have other forks of it called like Dragonfly, and everything's very fly. Um, so Bitly was this tiny little feature of another failed product. Um, but around that time, they realized social sharing was starting to catch on. Twitter was just getting started, was still a small company crashing all the time, uh, and that there was actually a use for social analytics. Um, and that's when Bitly really became its own thing and started taking off. And the first year of Bitly was just scaling. Uh, it was really just like keeping the servers from melting. Um, we'd build a system, and then the traffic would grow, and then we'd rebuild the system. And it was a lot of fun. Um, there were a lot of late nights and a lot of good nerd work. Um, and we still have a lot of growing up to do, but we're about three years later now. And we have built the largest system for analyzing human gossip in the history of humanity. Uh, because now we see how people are sharing content with each other, around 80 million pieces of content a day, around 300 million clicks a day. That is, in total, tens of billions of pieces of content and um, perhaps 100 billion clicks. But we don't know because we can't do a count on a database that big. 
um, I've asked. Mm -hmm. So the way I like to think of this is imagine a restaurant, okay? And imagine all these people having a really nice, polite dinner conversation with each other. And you know this photo is either staged or old because nobody's just looking at their phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> And if you've ever had this experience of, you know, you're talking about, you order something, it arrives, and somebody at the next table says, wow, that salmon looks amazing, and then they start talking about salmon, or you're talking about a playground, and that sort of like goes to the next table. Uh, we can now track that. But not only can we track that, we can also see the next dimension, which is everybody's uh, social presences as well. So while you're there, you're checking in on Foursquare, you're tweeting, um, maybe you're using Google+. Plus. I think there's at least one person who does. Um, and we can see the, yeah, well, these are actually my coworkers' avatars that I borrowed for this example, so I hope they won't be mad at me. Um, but we can see the connections between people uh, in the physical dimension, in time, in the social dimension, online, and in a few other ways as well. And I think that's really cool. Um, and that's really what my job is, is to try to understand that and then uh, build things that are interesting and build things that are good products, and then also at some point make money. And so the job I have falls into what we are now calling data science. How many people here have heard this phrase before? Just a few, OK. So data scientists do three things, um, and I'll step through that and then talk about why it needs a new name. They build mathematical models. Uh, and so the people I work with on my team come from strong math backgrounds, either from computer science, pure math, applied math, or physics. I love physicists. Um, they design systems that use those models uh, and, in our case, do them at a fairly large scale. I'm not a fan at all of the big data buzzword because I don't know how big is big. Um, and sometimes I go to conferences and get guys being like, how many nodes are in your Hadoop cluster? And I just want to tell them, you know, it doesn't matter how many nodes are in my Hadoop cluster, I'm still smarter than you. Um, <laughs> we only have 10. It still works. Um, and it also doesn't matter how much data you have. Like, if you don't know the OkCupid blog, they don't have very much data. But go look up blog.okcupid.com. I'm not going to put it on the screen because it's not family friendly. Um, but they find correlations between like, the pose your avatar is taken in and how likely it is for you to get laid. And that's the PG ones. Um, so it, yeah, it's a brilliant data blog. Um, and the final thing data scientists do is ask questions. And this came up at lunch, actually, in that it, it's fairly hard to find these people who can do math, who can build systems and write code, and who actually have enough empathy for humanity to know what's interesting to look at with all of this other stuff. And so that's why we need a new kind of person. And that's why the term data scientist has come into use. And I think of these people as combining four main skills. That is uh, the engineering background, the math background, hacking. And I use the term hacking because if someone hands you a database, uh, you need to be able to do something with that. If you can't, you're a second class citizen. Um, no, I'm serious. Like You can't depend on having an engineer to do the hard, the boring stuff for you. <laughs> Um, and in fact, so I joined Bitly a few months after they got started, and they handed me the root keys to the database and just said, don't break it. <laughs> um, and then the last piece, of course, is that, that curiosity. Um, and so at the intersection of all of these things, you find nerds. Um, we are finding a lot of awesome nerds. That is the middle. And this is an image I like to use to illustrate this. So this is a, a candle. Oh, it's really hard to see here. It's a candle burning down over 15 hours where they took a photo every hour. Uh, and so if you were to just naively think about the problem, or at least if I were, to, if you had to draw that line, um, I would have drawn it linearly from a naive point of view, like a candle burns down the same amount each hour. Uh, but if you look at the data, it's very clear. It's not linear. There's a nice curve here. It's really beautiful. Um, and so data scientists are the people who, who figure this out, who look at the data, who tell you what the math is, and then tells, tells you what it means in the end. So you need to buy a new candle every 15 hours. So now that you've got these people, you've got data and you've got some data scientists, it's required a bit of restructuring or new thinking around how an organization is built to support that kind of functionality. 
And I spend a fair amount of time now talking to people who run very large companies where they say, great, I got a chief scientist. What do I do with him? It's always him. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, OK, uh, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? Have you thought about you know, having a hackathon, like getting people to, to have ideas? And they're like, no, 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 chief scientist has ideas. The engineers build the ideas. Like, no. Um, so at Bitly, we're, we're very, um, I always emphasize that <laughs> ideas come from everywhere. In fact, uh, the woman who runs our community team comes up with the best ideas for us to look into. Um, of course, we have the luxury of working with a lot of really smart, creative people. And I, like, I don't care if your job is in biz dev. I still want to know what you're thinking and what you think would be amazing. Um, and so I'm excited looking forward uh, for this whole profession, um, not just because it's what I want to do and I'm excited that I can get paid to do it, uh, but because I think it's changing the way large organizations and startups are built around data and around asking questions about human behavior. Okay, I can rant about that for a while, but um, now I want to show you some things we've actually learned from the data, so you'll believe me that this is cool. The very first thing we learned, and I hope you can see the screen because it's a lot funnier than I am, is that your social network is not my social network. So again, we have these naive assumptions that everyone uses Facebook the same way. Everyone uses Twitter the same way. Um, this is, in fact, exactly not the case. So this is a tweet from a young woman saying any white person on Twitter is a spam account. It's true for her, uh, judging from the people in the room, not true for most of us. Right? Um, and here's a guy on Facebook who had a funeral for his fish with all his Lego men in attendance. And I know you can't see this in the back, so the very last comment is, may Cod rest his soul. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't see this stuff on my Facebook wall, but I wish I did. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier that we analyze social sharing in several different dimensions, of which the two core dimensions are time and space. Time is really important. So we looked at content like this, which is a picture of an otter cuddling a kitten. It's what we call evergreen content or silly things on the internet, and it makes up around 20% of the links that are shared every day. Um, content like this has that same social distribution pattern, but it is a much longer curve. So it spikes up and then it, it goes on, because whenever you see a kitten, you're gonna like seeing a kitten. Then we looked at breaking news content. Um, at the time we did this experiment, there had just been this earthquake <laughs> on the East Coast. And I don't know if you could feel it here. Um, oh, as far south as Georgia, Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah. Okay. We could feel it in New York, but I thought my CTO was kicking my desk. <laughs> like it, it was really minor in New York. Um, but, but it was breaking news. And it turns out that, of course, follows the same burst and decay pattern, but it's much tighter. right? So. Um, within 15 minutes, most interest in this event had died out. And then we looked at the median by social network. So we found that there were two things that changed the, the speed at which content uh, distributes itself or propagates online. One is the kind of content with the cute things and the breaking news on the extremes. The second being the, the design of the social network. So the half-life, that is the, the time in which a link will get half of the clicks it will ever get, is shortest on Twitter. It's 2.8 hours. It's a little longer on Facebook, 3.1 hours. And then we have a few anomalies, like YouTube, which is seven hours, StumbleUpon, which is as long as you keep paying the money, but usually around nine hours. Um, and I thought that, that was pretty interesting, because if you have quick-moving content, Twitter is definitely the network to share it on. So we do a lot of counting at Bitly. I'm really not ashamed to admit that a lot of the things we've learned have just been you know, throwing out. Hadoop is a great tool for counting things in a distributed way. That's about all it is, but we use it for that all the time. Sometimes you have to count things cleverly, and this is one really for the nerds in the room. Um, so we wanted to figure out for a given web page what language it was. And by language, I actually mean, like, is it English? Is it Spanish? Is it French? Is it Japanese? Um, and we often see pages that are a tweet where Twitter.com is English, the tweet might have a couple characters of Japanese in it, or it might have three words of Spanish, but the name of an artist that could be any language. Um, and so Google's Translate API, or the classic content classification approach, was failing for us. 
because Twitter.com is English, so pretty much anything on Twitter.com comes back as English. But if I show you that tweet and you don't speak Spanish, it's really not very useful for you. So we realized we had a better data source. Um, every time someone clicks on a Bitly link, we see the language in their browser. And that data looks like this. So um, if you're a nerd, this is not so hard to parse. Like, they're the two-letter language codes. It's pretty easy to write a parser for this. And then we build a distribution. So we say, OK, basically, how many are English? How many are, this is a Spanish language article about Google+. You can see Spanish is the big bar, then English, then Catalan, then Russian, and so on from there. Uh, there's a bias to English being higher because most browsers, if their native language is not available, default to English. So you count for the bias. We measure the entropy of this distribution. And if the entropy indicates that one language is significant enough, we assign that label. And so that's how we know what spoken language is in a page. Oh, and the code is really small. I just put it here to show it's like this much code and with comments. This is Python. Um, and that lets us take pages like this, which is a four-square check-in in Japanese, and say that it's Japanese, even though there's a lot of English actually on the page. And foursquare.com is, in fact, an English language site. So that's something I thought is cool because it's counting, but it's counting cleverly, and it lets us add this dimension to the data that we didn't know before. We do the same thing for location relevance. So I can tell you which URLs are statistically relevant to Orlando, Florida. And I'll show you later if we have time. All right, so time is one dimension. Geography is another dimension. We did this piece with Forbes where we wanted to understand how people in the United States consume US news. So we went and looked at uh, clicks on different news sites. They were all news sites that were in our top 20 with, we thought, national media aspirations. Um, and we looked for each state at the divergence from the mean for each publication in that state. So it do, if something shows up on a state here, it doesn't mean it had high volume. It means that it had a significant percentage over the mean in that state. It was disproportionately represented. And we learn a bunch of things that are totally obvious, like people in Texas really like Fox News. <laughs> we also learn that they like the Seattle Times in Washington and the New York Times in New York. Um, they like NPR in Oregon. There are a lot of hippies there, I hear. Um, and they like The Onion in Wisconsin. <laughs> and apparently somebody actually buys USA Today, because even here in Florida, that's the, the most disproportionately represented news source. I think it's the hotels, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we like pictures, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it, you can Google this on the Forbes site, but you can actually go in and see for each news source uh, what the geo distribution was. So that's the New York Times. Um, this is Al Jazeera, which correlates roughly um, with population. So that's spatial relevance. Another atomic unit in our, our data is people. And so we use a lot of metaphors at Bitly, and this is one I really like. My colleague Matt LeMay came up with it, and we call it the chicken-kitten metaphor. That is, uh, what you share is not the same as what you click on. And we see both sets of data. And so people share things like this. Uh, like a news article or a very serious political news article or something that shows that they were actually looking for a Valentine's Day gift or something cool they saw. This is a piece of art, a kaleidoscope trash can. The same people who were sharing these links were clicking this. That's Kourtney Kardashian for those in the back. Um, this for those in the back. Again, it's a college humor joke about infidelity. Much funnier if you read it than if I say that. Um, some sports thing. Oh, I'll leave that up for a minute. Um, <laughs> okay, sports are always popular to read, not as popular to share. A very small population actually share all the sports content they read. Um, and so the metaphor, of course, we present ourselves online like Superman. We, we share things that represent ourselves well. Um, but, you know, really, we're like little puny Clark Kent reading about Kourtney Kardashian. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> and so, so that's at an individual level. Um, we're also really interested in studying this at the community level. And so we did this project 
with Scientific American last December where we were curious about how uh, people read about science on the internet. And so this is a graph model of co-clicks between related topics. And so we took all the science content we had in a week period um, and separated it into you know, all the different subfields, so biology, chemistry, math, statistics, computer science, physics, et cetera. And then we went one level out in the graph and said people who clicked on that science stuff, what else did they click on and what are the topics in those links? And there are a few surprising things in here. So physics and fashion are really close together. Um, it turns out when we went back to look at the data, there was an article about an outfit, clothing you can make out of milk, like milk protein that gets processed into cloth. Um, that seems to be the thing that united the fashion and physics communities that week. Um, but we also see that um, computer science is close to both math and statistics, but math and statistics are nowhere near each other. Not a surprise for anyone who studied any of those topics, but kind of sad. Um, and finally, chemistry and religion are really off to the side. There's a third category of content uh, that looks like that as well. We didn't put it on the graphic because it's pornography. So people who click on pornography only click on pornography. People who click on religion only click on religion. And people who click on chemistry only click on chemistry. So if you know any chemists, be nice to them. They need friends. Um, and so another thing we've looked at, um, I mentioned earlier that Bitly is international, but um, the internet really does reflect the real world. And this is a raw graph of click traffic uh, during the Arab Spring from uh, six Arab Spring countries with Syria at the top, then Bahrain, Egypt, Yemen, Tunisia, and Libya at the bottom. And just to zoom in on uh, two of them, the, this is Egypt where you can see where they actually cut the internet <coughs> off in February 2011. Uh, this bottom graph is from Arbor Networks, which is the raw network traffic graph, which is mirrored pretty much exactly by the, that part of the Bitly traffic graph. Um, and then the one I, I like to look at here is Tunisia, because there was no infrastructure interference in Tunisia during the revolution. But we still see something totally remarkable, which is um, during this period, that's where the revolution happened. So this is just clicks on bit.ly links, uh, where each bump is a day, because people click on links during the day more than at night. Um, and this reflects what was happening in an incredibly chaotic society at that time. Most of this traffic was to and from Facebook, um, not other social networks in that case, and some was email. Um, I'm not a political scientist, but we've given all of this data to political scientists at George Washington University who are studying it to try and see what, if any, relevance it had, but I still find it completely fascinating that we see the effects of huge societal changes in how people click on things on the internet. Um, another more lighthearted uh, side to this is that whenever I go give a talk in another country, I try to look up which celebrities get the most attention via Bitly in that country. And it is, um, so I was just in Germany, Lady Gaga is huge in Germany, whereas Kim Kardashian wins here every time. <laughs> and just to lighten the mood even further, this is the cutest kitten from 2011. <laughs> Again, hours of Hadoop processing, totally <laughs> worth it. We had a bit.ly hack day, and uh, well, let's just say out of it came trendingkitten.com. <laughs> so creativity, going back to the very beginning, um, let's talk about that. So uh, this is Robert Downey Jr. teaching us math, right? I thought it was pretty funny. He's always doing things with his hands, right? Um, this is an Onion article that says, um, Disney Lab unveils its latest line of genetically engineered child stars. They're so lifelike you can't tell they don't have souls, <laughs> right? So this stuff is really funny. Um, and I want to think about why it's funny. So I'm a computer scientist, and I really like algorithms. And I think it's funny because it takes our expectations, and it goes one step adjacent to those expectations. And that's the source of creativity. Um, it's really taking the things you know and finding the things that are adjacent and unexpected to them. And it helps to have boundaries on your thinking. Um, in the same way that poetry can be intensely creative because of the rules around it, um, the rules we have, and in fact, the, 
the restraints we have on our capabilities make us creative in that a lot of what we do at Bitly is creative because we have to be at the scale of the internet on a fairly small budget. Uh, we were talking about that a bit at lunch. That causes you to be technically very creative. Um, but we also tend to develop boundaries as we grow up. So I love this. This is a 12-year-old boy trying to pick his screen name, right? And he's, he's got like good names. In fact, Punk of Funk is like totally great. And then he writes like note to self, these are stupid. Do not, do not be bread boy. Right? So it's Right? Zelda Conquer, that's pretty good. Gunsling and Pimp. Um, and he's 12, right? <laughs> so this is where art and science come together in picking your screen name. And the internet is the greatest catalyst for creativity we have ever seen in the history of humanity, even if it is just a series of tubes. So this is another project I wanted to show you. It's by a guy at NYC Resistor named Ranji, and it's called Pentometron. And it crawls Twitter for tweets in iambic pentameter, and then it assembles them into sonnets. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really great. Um, usually, there's one in there that's not appropriate, but I found one that is OK to put on the screen. Well, except the last line. Um, <laughs> But again, this is a guy who does not have a machine learning and AI background. He was just really curious about it and started playing with it. And he is an intensely creative artist. Um, and giving him the tools to, to crawl Twitter and like write an algorithm like this led to something that was just absolutely brilliant. Uh, and another thing I wanted to show you is Shapeways. How many people here have heard of Shapeways? OK, so you're going to love this. Or MakerBot, which is, again, another company that came out of Resistor um, and is, um, well, so MakerBot is a 3D printer you buy and take to your house, and it prints things out of plastic uh, off 3D models. They have a website called Thingiverse where you can share things as open source. In fact, you can download a 3D model of my head and print it out if you like. Um, that's because they, they went on the Colbert Report, and they got the scanner to scan Colbert, and then they had it. And they were like, oh, let's have a party and scan people's heads and put them on the internet. And it was a great party. Um, but it's a. It's definitely something in which the value of the item, so the value of your MakerBot grows as the community <coughs> grows, because more people create 3D models that they upload as open source that you can then download. Uh, and the real power of this comes out when you realize that it will totally change the way we consume physical objects, and that one day we needed a doorknob. We printed a doorknob. We had a doorknob. We never left the house. Um, and Shapeways is one in which you can design a 3D model. You can do it on their website, and then they'll print it in a variety of different materials for you, uh, plastic, metal, porcelain. Um, and it, it gets more expensive as the objects get larger, but this is something an artist made. Um, and you can order it for $90 <laughs> on that site. Or you can make your own model, your own tentacled monster jewelry, if you are so inclined. OK. And while we're talking about art and science, I did feel like there was a third word that was left out of that equation entirely. And that is business, which I have come to learn is not a dirty word. So we can think about art as working on projects that are only constrained by culture. right? Art is only valuable if culture values it. Uh, science are things that are constrained by intellectual ability to prove things. And business is the set of things constrained by their ability to generate revenue. Uh, that's not an evil thing. Uh, it's not a horrible thing. It means that if you can find a project that exists at the intersection of all three, you've got a company. If you have only something that exists in the art and science space, you have a hack. Um, the reason you might want a company instead of a hack is that a company can scale to change the world. A hack has a lot of trouble doing so. Right. So I gave away the punchline. I always I have a rule. I have to have at least one kitten and one equation in every talk. And I realized there would not be an equation in this talk. So this is my equation hack. Um, and then a few things that I've learned from trying to do this in New York. And then I would love to hear more feedback, because you've been very quiet, the responsive audience. Um, the most important thing in having any effect on the culture in which you live is to find a community and from what I've seen this morning, there's a great one forming here. Um, that is because while you are a superhero, you need other superheroes around you 
Um, and in general in life, I think if you surround yourself with people who think about and do interesting things, you will generally have a much more interesting life. Um, and cities are really important for that. Um, and so I've lived in small cities and large cities and traveled a lot. And cities give you a lot of things for free. Um, I've lived in Providence, Rhode Island, where you could fit all of the geeks in the entire state in a room like this. And nothing happened until we actually did that. And now uh, Providence has its own startup accelerator. It has scholarships for keeping students in Providence once they graduate. Um, it's, it has more angel investors because people who had sort of semi-retired into Providence became aware of the community and were able to invest their time and their money back into it. Um, and it, it has an advantage in being small in that the entire state is so densely connected that if you need something, like you need to talk to the mayor, somebody in the room will know how to do that. Uh, and that was a huge advantage there. And then in New York, where I live now, which is a huge city, uh, you have the advantage that everything exists in New York. Every industry, every person comes to New York eventually. Um, and so many interesting people collect there. It's really just a matter of putting up a flag and saying, I want to have a conversation about museums and art and squid. And people will show up for that. We have a machine learning meetup that gets 400 people a month to come hear about like little details of like LDA algorithms and things. Um, it's pretty amazing. And if the community you want doesn't exist, you can build it. So plant your hack and why or your data <coughs> science community, and people will believe you that it's real. Uh, at least if you pretend it for long enough, which is how New York built its tech community. The first year, it really was sort of a, wouldn't it be nice if, and now it's totally real. Um, I like pictures of trees. Um, so the world is a beast. And again, another metaphor. Uh, I, I'm on Mayor Bloomberg's Technology and Advisory Innovation Council, and I've done some work with other parts of city government and politics. Um, mostly in trying to help Hack and Y and help Resistor and other things like that grow in the city, help the city open more data and APIs, and when they open data, not make it an access database, <laughs> make it like something actually useful. Um, and the one thing I've learned, and this may be obvious to everyone else, is that uh, it's, it's like moving an elephant. It's not like you can come in and say, this is how it should be, and they'll listen to you. It's that the elephant is moving along, and there are points at which you can push it a little bit and have a change actually take effect. But you have to wait for those points. Um, you have to wait until there's somebody receptive who wants to hear what you're saying, and then deliver a package to them and get the right people promoted if you can. Um, so changing tactics entirely. Uh, another thing we've had success with is reducing friction. So just making it very easy for people to participate, making it easy for people in New York to say, I'm a data scientist. I go to the data science meetup. Um, or I want to work with your API, it's easy. Um, this theme carries across all sorts of projects. If you want people to understand it, you have to make it easy for them to understand. And this is an image of a balloon popping with powdered sugar in it that um, I think sums up friction well. Right. So another one is to be curious about everything. And curiously enough, a lot of studies show that lucky people are consistently lucky because they're consistently observant and curious. And I love that, that it, first, that people research that. And then second, that it means that you can learn to be lucky because you can learn to be observant and curious. You can train yourself to be lucky. And also to realize that failing is actually a helpful thing, not because you learn valuable lessons for the future necessarily, but because wherever you end up, where, when you fail, will be somewhere you didn't expect. And that's where the, that creative serendipity comes from. Um, in fact, that's where this came from. Was, no, it's totally true. They were researching uh, like blood flow to the heart. And all these patients came back and said, I saw another effect. Um, and that's something like a $5 billion business now. And my last bit of advice is for the serious nerds in the room, be loud. And that means get up and talk about the things you care about, uh, which is something that I'm, I'm giving a talk here in front of a room full of people. But I am pretty shy. And uh, it's not an easy thing to do. But if you care about what you're talking about, other people will care about it too. And the louder you are, the message will spread further and have a greater effect. And 
So I now spend a lot of time encouraging my quieter colleagues to actually go out and talk about the things that they do because they're amazing. And the last thing is to make the kinds of things that exist in the world that you want to be in. And that means that if somebody offers you millions of dollars to sell out your data to target ads and you're not into that, say no, it's okay. Like just do things that make the world the place you want it to be. So thank you.